Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. And by Wyndham Garden Lafayette. From Chopsticks Restaurant in Lafayette, we're out to lunch with Christian Maiden, publisher and editor of The Current. It's business Acadiana style. Welcome to Out to Lunch. I'm Christian Maiden. History is a messy business. It's full of mixed and conflicting perspectives. It's subject to revision for the right or wrong reasons. And while it's tempting to think of it as a collection of facts, history is really a collection of perspectives especially for histories of people. And think about it, there are competing biographies or authorized biographies or even unauthorized biographies and, and especially autobiographies. My guests today are both writers of history. Jason Terrio is a freelance author, a New Iberia native, and an academic. He's written on a number of subjects, not just about people, including World War II histories and works about the environment, particularly the Gulf Coast. He's a former fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School where he worked on environmental policy. He's currently working on a history of tank barges. Jason, welcome to Out to Lunch. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Deirdre Gogarty Morrison wrote her own history. She's published an autobiography about her career as a boxer called My Call to the Ring. Deirdre was born and raised in Ireland, but moved to Lafayette to work with the legendary boxing coach, Bo Williford. Irish law made it difficult for women to box professionally. She was Ireland's first women's world champion and was inducted into the International Women's Boxing Hall of Fame. Deirdre, welcome to Out to Lunch. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Of course. I'd really like to know more about, you know, where you start, like where the idea comes from to say, I'm going to write an autobiography. Where, where did that come from? Well, um, I had a very kind of roller coaster boxing career. They didn't let women box in Ireland. So I came to the United States, like totally knowing, no, not knowing anyone here. And I ended up in Lafayette through a mutual friend. And um I, of course, I was terrified. I didn't know Bo Williford at all. And um, so I had to put my trust in him because I wanted to have a career in the United States where they allowed women to box over here. So um, I made the journey over and obviously coming from Ireland to, to Lafayette was a big change, big cultural change. And also the climate was a major change. And um, I had a very exciting career with a lot of adventure. But the main reason I wanted to do the book was to uh, hopefully inspire other people, no matter what their passion is, to just blindly go after it 110% and, um, and everything you, you wish to come true will. Yeah. Where, where did you start? I mean, I'm trying to imagine how, you know, when you, you kind of open up the screen or you open up your pad, I mean, you got to put pen to paper some, some time. I mean, where did you start with your own life? Well, I started writing bits here and there, and then I was uh, lucky enough to coach a student called Jesse Saloon in our boxing club, and his mom was a uh, editor, so I collaborated with his mom, Daryl and Saloon, and um, together we were able to produce a really well-rounded, excellent book, and uh, I think it really captured the struggle of my career, but also the triumph, and I hope it will inspire others. Did you, did you learn something new about yourself in the process? I mean, going um, back over your own life? Well, I, I've always learned, no matter what the task is, it's going to be tough, you know, Nobody writes a book easily. It's, um, you know, something I think a lot of people think about writing a book, but actually doing it and following through, not many people actually get to the other end. So I went in knowing it was, it was going to be a long slog, but it was really uh, harder than I expected in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, it actually took me four years to, to, to get it finished, and um, then we, we got it published, and um, it was worth it, though. It's worth seeing everything down in, in, you know, if ever I pass away, <laughs> at least my story is down in print for hopefully future generations to gain some inspiration from. Yeah. So, Jason, you trained as a journalist and then decided to do something else, which was probably a wise choice. Um, you're now working on a memoir, right, of a senator, am I correct? Uh, I'm working on a couple of different things. I'm working on a little memoir of a former state senator. I've got a couple of uh, what we call sponsored histories or paid books for companies. 
um, that are interested in having uh, their history recorded and, and story told and preserved, either for their family members or for their stockholders or for uh, just for simply for posterity. So those, those are sort of the, uh, the, the books that I've been working on and am working on right now. So I'm really curious about the process of writing you know, working with somebody on their own biography, right? I mean, if you write someone's memoir, I mean, right, it seems like a deeply personal thing. So, I mean, how do you approach actually, you know, cataloging or telling the story of someone else's memories? you got to start from the beginning, obviously. Uh, I have just completed about almost three years of interview sessions with, let's say, a mid-80-year-old former um, a president of a major tank barge company in South Louisiana uh, and his father had started in the 1920s and I spent uh, probably a few hundred hours recording this man. Uh, thankfully he had a great memory and re recalled details going back to when he was first started working for his dad driving a pickup truck uh, and a tool truck uh, at the age of 12 years old and driving boats for his dad at the age of 14 years old tugboats. And so it was really unique to see how, uh, through his eyes, the company advanced over the years. But, but even more to see as the years progressed here recently, his health declined until the very end. And when I got a phone call from the family saying that uh, he was on his deathbed and he wanted to share some few details with me, the details were to make sure which boat came in first in which chapter. Uh, and specifically what name, the names of the boats and how he wanted them listed. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the poor fellow died a couple of days later. So it was a, um, a moving experience, a really fascinating experience, and one that I always treasure to actually hear some, a, a person's entire life story over the course of two or three years and then see them sort of you know, pass away. And that's sort of the purpose of writing books. And uh, you mentioned that just a moment ago. You know, it's a... It's a person's legacy. It's it's for the future. It's for their families. Uh, for this company in particular, it's a family-owned private private business, and there's next generations of, of folks that want to carry on those traditions uh, and the, the standards of of of, uh, of industry excellence in the way that you treat customers and whatnot and their employees. So encapsulating all that into a 200-page book with you know 100 something photographs is sort of the the end goal of of doing company histories and, and um, histories of people and memoirs. How did you land doing this? I mean, what was your first sponsored history? I mean, where, where, do, you, where do you go to get that gig? This one I'm holding in my hand right here. It's okay. called Great Game Paradise, A History of Vermilion Corporation. Uh, and this is a book that was uh, put out by UL Press uh, this past September. And as you can see, it's a beautiful cover. Uh, you might call this a coffee table book, but it's 200 pages with 100 colored photographs in it. And this was uh, the president of this company uh, contacted me some years ago through our network or circle of, of contacts. There's not too many people who are out there promoting that they do um, history books uh, that, are, that don't work for a university. Um, so while I do consider myself a scholar of some sorts, I don't work for a university. I'm an independent contractor, basically. Uh, and so they, they reached out to me, said that uh, they had just recently lost one of their oldest surviving employees, who was 85, and boy, they wished they could have gotten his story before he passed. And so basically they paid me to go around and interview all of the surviving employees, and there were many. This was a, basically a land company that, that, uh, a land company that managed 125,000 acres of marsh land south of here in Vermilion Parish. And so you had three generations of of trappers and duck hunting guides and folks who worked for this company along with all of the generations of shareholders that would come in from Chicago and New York and all over the place uh, and so to tie in those together was was sort of the uniqueness of this book local people from areas of Abbeville, Erath, Pocona Island uh, and some of the big wigs people you know the barons of industry like Sterling Morton of Morton Sugar the Malcohennies for example uh, Exxon uh, Mobil um, humble, humble oil executives. All these folks coming down here and cherishing this great game paradise, and the people who were hired to uh, facilitate that. So uh, that was the purpose of that book, and um, it was uh, well received from from all folks involved. Very cool, uh, Deirdre. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about you know um, 
you know, your career as a boxer. Um, and one thing that struck me was something you said that, you know, women could not box in Ireland. I mean, why not? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I think just Ireland's just a very traditional country and the um, old school establishment, so to speak, I guess. I mean, they didn't want women coming in there and I guess they pictured us being very raw and unpolished and kind of maybe embarrassing the sport. So um, when I started boxing, I made sure to study it very carefully and do my very, very best to be technically proficient. That way, maybe I'd be more accepted into boxing. Now, I was allowed to join gyms and I was allowed to spar, but I was never allowed to compete. So um, now it's perfectly, you know, it's, uh, we have a world champion from Ireland. She's a gold medal Olympian and she's a world champion. So obviously it's come a long way in just a 20 year period. Uh, but back then, um, it was a dead end road. It looked almost impossible. So I put my heart set on coming to the United States and, um, I was able to find Bo Williford, and he happened to be in Lafayette, and that's how I ended up down in Lafayette. Um, uh, very sadly, we lost Bo back in July, but, um, you know, he was the one that back then, um, you know, people were saying, what are you doing with a woman boxer, you know? And um, he would just very stubbornly say, well, she's really skilled, and I think she can be something, and he would just... He stuck by me, and we went all the way to a world title. Wow. I mean, were you able to make a living doing this? I mean, Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my, I made, made a living through graphic design. Um, when I was in Ireland, I studied it, and then I began working on the um, animated series Mutant Nin uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which actually was originally a different name, but they changed it to make it more family-friendly. Sure. Um, what was the original name? Uh, the uh, Teenage Mutant uh, Killer Turtles or something like that. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, that's they definitely changed not it as... to Ninja. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I was working on that while I was in Ireland, and um, I got a lot of experience in um, design. And um, I came over here, became a graphic designer, literally cycled around Lafayette with a big, huge portfolio. Uh, on my bike, sweating profusely, arriving to interviews. I don't know what they must have thought of me, but um, I freelanced a lot around the area, and um, that was my bread and butter. That's how I made a living, and then in the evening, I go to the boxing gym. Wow, wow. So so uh, how far did you get? I mean, did you... In... Well, I got all the way to an undisputed world title. That's pretty far. Division. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Um, but it, it was a long slog and, you know, working a day job and training for world title fights in the evening and then traveling a lot. It, it, it was it was a tough road, but um, my most memorable fight was on the undercourt of Mike Tyson and Frank Bruno in 1996. And that's the first time women ever fought on pay-per-view. And that's what the fight most people remember because... Um, it, it was, you know, it, it surprised people that women could fight like that. I mean, me and my opponent knew we could, but apparently uh, 80 million other people didn't. So um, it was a big breakout fight for women's boxing. Wow. I can imagine the atmosphere around something, especially having Tyson on... Yes, you know. yeah. We were kind of the undercord getting booed on our way into the arena and... Um, you know, uh, jowls and whistles and, you know, making fun of us until we started fighting. And then it was uh, the whole the whole crowd shifted to excitement. So it was a great feeling. Did, did you get to meet Mike Tyson? Oh, yeah. You know, I was at the way in with him in the press conference and everything. Wow. Yeah. Did he have a comment on the fact that, you know, his undercard well, he were women was a boxers? Big, he was a big fan of Christy Martins, the girl I was fighting. So, I mean, he was fine with them. I mean, he knew we could fight, yeah. you know. So, so that's interesting because it kind of shows that, I guess, that maybe the the professional culture hadn't changed around. But, like, seems like boxers themselves had a much different attitude, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all you got to do is get in, in the ring and show what you can do. And they right away can see if you have the skill or not. And, um you know, that you're a credit to the sport and not going in there flailing, you know, um, that you've really worked hard and studied the game. And other boxers can appreciate the, um, the sacrifice it took to do that, so they understand. You're listening to Out to Lunch. This is Christian Mader. 
I'm speaking with boxer and writer Deirdre Gogarty Morrison and biographer Jason Terrio. We'll be back after a brief break. You're listening to Out to Lunch. This is Christian Mader. I'm speaking with boxer and writer Deirdre Gogarty Morrison and biographer Jason Terrio. So, so Jason, you, you seem to have really been able to write about a lot of different subjects, not just because, you know, the nature of your work, but it seems like you have a lot of interests. I mean, I, like, you know, your resume is impressive. Um, I, I, tell me a little bit about what you're, what you're doing now. I mean, like the, 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 the tank barges, am I saying that correctly? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, part of the reason uh, for that is the unique place in which we live down here in, spe- specifically in the Louisiana Gulf Coast. It's such, as you know, you're from here, uh, such a rich culture, a lot of um, history, uh, a lot of involvement uh, with our um, physical space, with our environment, with our coastal environment, and all the wonderful riches that, that come from it. Um, so uh, I, I work on, on projects, three or four projects at a time. I've got a couple of those going on right now. I do a few other things. I give speeches. Um, I, do, uh, I do background research for law firms if, if needed. Uh, and I stay connected into the academic world. So I've got a project right now at, uh, with the Center for Louisiana Studies where we are, in fact, going to be doing a pilot podcast uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks on a story about the French-speaking World War II veterans from South Louisiana. And so I did dozens of interviews a long time ago, 15 years ago, and that, st- that uh, project has uh, recently been uh, resurfaced. And I am on a mission to find the last few remaining World War II veterans still left alive in Acadiana and interviewing them. So I found three of them in the last couple of months. And these are guys who actually spoke French uh, and talked about speaking French as, as, um, as part of their military service, their experience overseas in places like French North Africa and, and certainly in France. And so I'm trying to capture those last remaining stories and whatever letters uh, are floating around out there or old interviews of somebody's grandpa that's in a VHS tape and it's somewhere buried in a box and they don't know what to do with it. Give me a call. I, I have the ability to have that material digitized and preserved. And so that's the, the next big project and I'm hoping to learn a little bit about how to do a podcast from you guys over here. So I am taking notes. Okay. <laughs> you shouldn't learn from me. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, so, I mean, you said that you're, you're, you're trying to find these sort of last remaining guys I mean, how do you how do you do that how do you track them down well you do things like podcasts and okay. um uh, you call all the media contacts that you have i think there's a, a uh, an article coming out a future story coming out in the daily in the uh, baton rouge advocate later this week i think on wednesday uh, so that's i'm trying to get the word out people to contact me go to my website if you need to contact me jasonterrio.com call me i'm not going to give up my cell phone over the air here or email me and all, my, all that information is on my website. So if you know of any veterans left around, I mean, these guys are, and gals are 95, would be the youngest. 96, the guys I interviewed um, this, the past couple of months are, you know, in their 97, 98 years old. They're still getting around. And luckily, you know, they're still healthy enough to, to participate in interviews. And I've been recording them, uh, video recording them as well. So I, I put some of those up on my website uh, just to get the word out, you know, contacting newspapers, radio, TV, uh, in the hopes that we can find a few of those hidden gems um, that maybe people kind of forgot about, um, old old guys in in um, you know who are being taken care of by their you know by one of their children or something like that or um, old old letters old old VHS tapes if we can find those so I'm gathering a few bits um, and uh, so it's been a worthwhile project. So how did you go from you know TV broadcasting to the Harvard Kennedy School? Oh. There's not enough time in your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the bullet uh, points. Well, then. let's see. I, uh, I would have to say that a major tragic event of April 2010 in the Deepwater Gulf of Mexico is probably what gave me that opportunity. Uh, the, the BP Deepwater Deep Horizon oil spill um, was, a, was a big event. I, I consider myself an energy historian. and In fact, uh, some of the professors that I had uh, and, and worked with were... Um, were sort of the pioneers in that field of energy history, oil and gas history, and um, and uh, they wrote, you know, several books. My my main advisor was working on a, a book of Exxon at the time, and I thought that uh, we needed to get ahead of this as far as uh, our little group of researchers and historians at the University of Houston, which is where I received my doctorate degree in history, and I put on an oil spill symposium, and so I found all the experts 
you know, all around the Gulf of Mexico who had worked on various uh, major oil spills. There was a big one in 1979 off of Mexico. I found that guy. Uh, obviously, the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989 in Alaska. I found the head attorney who was the first guy on the boat there. And then all the folks involved um, in, in the most recent uh, spill and put on a big symposium and found I uh, was looking for a job because shortly after that I got my Ph.D. and just submitted a two-page application for this energy policy fellowship and got the job. And uh, that's what they wanted to know. I went up there, and uh, the, first, the first day I, uh, I asked uh, the guy in charge, I said, uh, so is there anyone here who's going to help, help me out and sort of help supervise me and what I'm supposed to be doing? They said, no, we don't have anyone here who's an expert in offshore oil and gas. You are. You're going to teach us about it. And that's, that's when I quickly learned how Harvard is so good because they bring all these experts in, and it kind of feeds into the rest of their program. So I was there for uh, – I commuted, believe it or not, from Houston, Texas, which is where I live now. Uh, 100, I lived there 125 days in Boston through one of the coldest winters. Um, but it was also the last time that uh, LSU beat Alabama – uh, eight years ago until just past Saturday. So lots of great memories of, uh, of living up there in Boston in the cold, um, but certainly it was a, a wonderful experience to, uh, to see uh, so many smart people and all these dignitaries that came through. So um, anyway, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a good time. Yeah. Um, Deirdre, you married your husband in a boxing ring. Yes. <laughs> Why not, huh? <laughs> Spent so much time there anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, what boxing ring? I mean, was, was uh, it? It was at our club, the Rage and Cajun Amateur Boxing Club. Okay. When we were on Macon Road, and Bo Williford, uh, he married us. He was like the referee. So, it was really cool and fun. I didn't want to have a. The, you know how, well, I don't know about you, but when I'm invited to a wedding, I'm kind of going, oh, Lord, you know, got to dress up, be bored, but. I wanted it to be fun, really fun, and for everybody who came to, to enjoy themselves. And I think it was very unique, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like to, I mean, Bo is, a, Bo is a guy I think that would probably deserve a biography all his own. How oh, did you, definitely, yeah. How did, you, how did you meet him? You said it was a mutual acquaintance? Yeah, it was a mutual friend called Patty Sauer. He was from England. He was a referee. And uh, he uh, wrote to Bo and asked him, would you have a look at this girl? She's very good, you know. Um, and Bo didn't want any part to do with me. In fact, when he did finally call me, he said it was just out of a favor to Patty. And he said, I don't know S about women's boxing and I don't want to learn. <laughs> but you know once he saw I had some skills and I'd put the work in and uh, he, he had me come over and he was he was really rough on me the first few days and he put me in with world champion Kenny Vice for sparring and um, I mean it was quite a, a, a beating but um, I kept coming back so yeah. I stuck with him and we went all the way to world title so, so exactly how long were you in professional boxing I'm sorry uh, well I I turned pro in um, 91, so, and I officially retired in 2005, so it was a long time. Yeah, and so how many, how many fights is well, that? Well, I ended up with um, 25, 22 wins and um, three losses, and uh, no, wait, five, no, 20 wins, five losses, I'm sorry, I sound punchy now. Um, yeah, but a lot of fights fell through. I had a ton of fights that just never worked out for whatever reason. It was very hard to find opponents sometimes. So uh, it was frustrating. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, you know, having to be on the bleeding edge, right, of being a woman in boxing, I mean, that, that it must have been you know, difficult to, um, to, to kind of, like, stay on top of it in the way that I guess, you know, other boxers do. And I guess what I mean by that is, like, you're talking about how, um, you know, it's, you have fights that fall through or, or right, even to the extent yeah. that, like, you're struggling to make a living off of it. Yeah, but. yeah, you definitely couldn't make a living. Um, so that, that was hard, too. And then the opponents, they were either very highly skilled or very poorly skilled, so it was very hard to find in between. You know, you were either fighting someone you could knock out in one round or fighting really, really tough fighters with loads of experience, you know. I mean, um, so, you know, it just was a long slog. You know, those girls that got a lot of experience usually had good promotion, and, you know, it was, it was all about being in the right place at the right time. So, I mean, what's the state of this now? I mean, like, versus where you found it? I mean, what, what, what is it like now? Well, uh, it's great now. I mean, they're putting uh, women's on, on main events on televised cards now. Um, we've got Carissa Shields, who's the gold medalist American. Um, 
So, you know, it's, it's come a long, long way. And our girl, uh, to Katie Taylor from Ireland, that she's on uh, DAZN all the time. So, you know, it's pretty amazing to see these girls routinely on these big, big cards, big time television, you know, versus what it was like back in my day. Hmm. Everyone's got a story to tell, and the sum total of those narratives make up history. And that means history belongs to storytellers, the people who take the time and effort to document the world around them. Deirdre and Jason, it's been great chatting with you both. Thanks for joining me today on Out to Lunch. Thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys. My guests on Out to Lunch today have been Deirdre Gogarty Morrison, retired boxing champ and author, and freelance historian and researcher Jason Terrio. You can learn more about Deirdre and Jason by following the links at our website, itsacadiana.com. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical producer is Eric Morell. Our researcher is Ann Christian. Today's show is engineered by Blake Longley. You can listen to this show and to past episodes of Out to Lunch Acadiana wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify. You can find all of our podcasts at itsacadiana.com. If you want to know what we look like, you can find photos from this show on itsacadiana.com, on our It's Acadiana Facebook page, and on Instagram at Out to Lunch Acadiana. These photos were taken by Lucius Fotno. You can find more of his photos at lafphoto.com. Out to Lunch is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsacadiana.com and KRVS 88.7 FM. I'm Christian Mader, editor of The Current, Lafayette's community-owned nonprofit newsroom. Thanks for joining me. For more great stories and conversation, check out thecurrentla.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter. I'll see you again here next week around the lunch table for more business Acadiana style. Out to Lunch. Bye-bye. Out to Lunch is recorded live at Chopsticks Restaurant in Lafayette, where East meets Southwest. Authentic Chinese cuisine prepared with fresh local ingredients. The Out to Lunch Acadiana theme music, Encore Monsieur, Nice Guy, is written by Mitchell Foreman and performed by Mitchell Foreman and Andre Michaud. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base, joneswalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. Support for Out to Lunch Acadiana comes from the Wyndham Garden Lafayette, located off Pinhook near Cali's Saloon. Wyndham Garden Lafayette is a pet and family-friendly hotel with reception space for large and intimate events, free parking, free Wi-Fi, and a free shuttle within three miles that includes the airport and downtown restaurants.